So welcome back to this evening conversation with uh, some very talented folks on storytelling, on the entertainment sector, on this new ecosystem that is producing conversations, pushing norms, changing societal, uh, or rather breaking down societal barriers, uh, creating awareness, and uh, uh, building a new community uh, that has now digital tools to reach millions around the world. I'm talking about the entertainment sector, I'm talking about uh, platforms such as Netflix, uh, Prime, and others. Many of them are local platforms catering to local constituencies. But the video on demand and private screens are redefining storytelling like never before. To discuss the economic, social, cultural, and regulatory aspects of this emerging sector that is creating employment, profits, and certainly um, catering to people's uh, needs and, and moods, uh, we have a very talented panel. Uh, to my immediate right, Shrishtri Behalarya, uh, who has been um, in this sector for nearly two, two decades and uh, is now uh, the head honcho of curating India content for Netflix. Okay. Um, and she is uh, building a library of films uh, produced out of India to take to the world. Uh, to her right is uh, uh, someone who needs no introduction, uh, uh, Vani Tripathi Tiku. Um, she is a powerhouse, um, both in terms of her opinions and in terms of her expression, uh, actor herself and now uh, the regulator uh, for film certification. Uh, to her right is Arjun Mathur, um, an actor from Bollywood, uh, as most of you can make out, a good looking guy who's <laughs> telling stories uh, uh, which are uh, uh, different and I will be speaking to him about his experiences in this uh, sector in the digital age. And finally, to my extreme right is uh, Vanessa Sindran. Um, she, is, uh, she produced a series that was the first acquisition by Netflix out of Africa. And uh, the series that she's working on uh, has many stories which we are going to explore uh, as part of this panel to uncover uh, the kaleidoscope of, um, of um, the industry, the kaleidoscope of the nuances of the industry, which uh, uh, are important for all of us to engage with in this digital age. Let me start with um, uh, Vani first. Uh, Vani, as a film certificate member, do we have permission to be f free and <laughs> open in this panel? Absolutely, free and fair. <laughs> Great. So with that, let me uh, uh, ask Shrishti, because uh, she's the one with the money, and she's the one with uh, the ability to, uh, to procure and produce films that she can take to the world. Shrishti, you've been in the industry for 20 years. What's different now? What's different with platforms such as Netflix and what is different with the new industry <laughs> economics that is emerging? Uh, I think it's uh, the opportunity. Uh, that's the biggest aspect. We are no longer restricted by uh, putting things out that have to reach everybody all the time. Uh, because it doesn't have to be like carpet bombing. We can be really precise. We know the people who we are talking to on most occasions. Everybody has a choice of watching whatever the mood they're in to watch. And I think that's given a lot of impetus to the whole the talent community. And right now we are seeing a boom in all of content creators, be it writers, be it producers, directors, actors. You're not kind of held back because you want to do something which may, may not find an audience in the traditional way. No, so let me just pose you, just push on that a little more. Uh, normally, if the actor produced a series of flops, mm -hmm. box office collections, uh, and unless you were the son or daughter of like a big star, it would mean the end of your career. Uh, what is the matrix of success, the measurement of success in the digital age for films that you produce? Uh, essentially, the beautiful thing about Netflix is that what we look for is the next story that you want to tell. We don't want your past work to be represented. We don't know where the next great story is going to come out of. Mm -hmm. And just because we don't live in your past work, we live in your future work. So what we look for is passion and creators who want to tell something authentic and true. And that's about the only kind of, we are not restricted by uh, you know, your box office success or your uh, popularity beyond the point. Uh, having said that, I mean, of course, we, we all love our movie stars, but what's important to us mm -hmm. is that we're telling the story well and authentically. How is this taking, how is this making Indian storytelling global? How is this new sec uh, uh, emergence 
I think that when you're creating something and if you're doing it for the right reason to tell the story in its best possible form, because another form of democratization that's happening because of streaming services is that you're not restricted to the traditional formats. So if you're doing a movie, it doesn't have to be three hours or it doesn't have to be one and a half hour or any such thing. It has to be as much as the story needs to be. If you want to explore a lot of themes within the same story, you have the series format. Within the series format, you also have like 20 minutes, you have 45 minutes, you have mm -hmm. 60 minutes. So it's all about how you want to tell your piece. And, and, and the reach, for example, Sacred Games or uh, the Mighty Little Beam, sorry, <laughs> Chota Beam. Uh, the Mighty Little Beam, yes. Mighty Little yes, Beam. Yes. Uh, how did they do? Uh, what was the impact for those productions? Uh, I think uh, what we found is that Sacred Games had uh, two thirds of its viewers outside of India. Hmm. So that just uh, shows us the power. And it was of released uh, across all your geography. Yes, every all the originals that we make on Netflix come out day and date on the same uh, at the same time across 190 countries, and we don't kind of push out our content based on where you're where you're at, what your gender is, what your ethnicity is. Uh, all that matters is that are you interested in this kind of story, because whatever it is that you're in the mood to watch, you're going to find it. Vanessa, can I turn to you? Let me now go to uh, what I call the content continent. Africa is a, store, is, is, a, is a geography of a billion stories which have yet to be told. Um, how does this emergence of uh, the digital platforms or VOD platforms change the, the sector for you, uh, who's been engaging with this for a while now in, in, in that part of the world? You're from Cape Town. Mm. So how does this open the world for you? What, are, what have been your experiences? around these new opportunities that you have now? It's a very exciting time, Shamir. Um, what we've experienced is in the last 20 years with our animation studio that if we have to go the cinematic route, there are certain hurdles you have to jump over and there's certain agency that's, that holds if that film or if that series should be released and how it's released and where it's released. We've been super successful as an animation studio to be able to, to produce um, two of, the, of Africa's most successful feature films, but there certainly have been lots of hurdles. We're just one studio that's made it. Um, there are so many studios, there are so many writers that um, write content for those studios that haven't quite had those opportunities. But what the huge disruptive giants are doing, like Netflix, are allowing a lot more creators to take that step into that space and to actually tell their stories. Obviously, the key thing um, about right now, what is so exciting about right now, is that our stories will break cultural barriers and that our stories can now be told to the world and we don't need to fit into a model anymore of what is good and what is entertaining. As long as the story is universally appealing and that it finds its audience, that's the big success. And if audiences are responding to that content, you will then see that this is good content. So it's a really exciting time. What we find from the African continent and what I've been involved in over the last 10 years is that there's a big gap between talent and opportunity and so bridging that gap is very important and as a studio and as a producer I've been a part of a couple of labs like the story lab, the writer's lab, a director's lab and what essentially that does is, is, is acts as that bridge, gives mm -hmm. that talent an opportunity to play in the space of presenting scripts to Netflix, to other big partners and then potentially having something that's produced so it's a very exciting time and I couldn't be more excited. Can you tell us, I mean, you've, we've spoken uh, backstage, but can you also share with us the story that you're telling through this series? I think that is a very interesting story. Uh, the, the script is very interesting. The, the script, the series that's been picked up, it's uh, called Mama, Mama K is Team 4, and it's from Zambia, and it's written by and created by Malenga Mulandema. She's a creator who reached out to our story lab in 2015. And the, the amazing thing about this is it represents um, girls of color, women of color on screen, which we haven't seen before. There are a lot of stories out there at the moment in this area, but this is one that's gotten Netflix's attention, which we're very excited about. It's about four teenage girls who have to navigate high school, but also save the city of Lusaka from villains. And it really taps into these girls' um, excellence in engineering and in coding and programming as they create all their gadgets and they tackle these big super villains who've got as much money as you could think of in the world. But these young girls have outsmarted these big uh, wealthy villains. So it's a really positive story where women of color can see themselves on screen. And th for me, if even more exciting is that there are women of color who are writing this series. There are eight writers from Senegal, Ghana, Zambia, Nigeria, South Africa who are writing the series. This is their story and this will be a story that 
is, is very successful. I'm really trusting it will be because it really is their authentic voice coming through on the screen. So watch out for Mama K's Team 4 in about two years. So these, <laughs> so these are the uh, teenage superheroes. They are. Uh, girls of color yes. uh, who are going to college and school and learning the craft and as well as saving the city. That's right. And that's uh, breaking the stereotype uh, of the traditional uh, narratives that were coming out Absolutely. of the Absolutely. It's what women do every day, really. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, but let me ask you the, the tougher question. The big investments to produce these stories are still coming from um, transnational corporations, Western sources of funding, maybe even Bollywood someday. How, what is the agency available with these local geographies when the stories are still financed by others from outside? Well, I completely agree with you. There has been control. There has been some sort of funnel that, that's, that content creators have had to go through and producers have had to go through. There has been a lot of control of funding, and that's why I think we see this huge inequality when we see to quality, uh, quality that is culturally relevant on screen. And I think that's about to be smashed. It has been smashed. It is being smashed, um, which is really exciting. I believe it exists, and, it, and the only way to challenge that is to, is to partner with as ambitious partners as the story will, um, is asking for. And I've been at many meetings over the last four years with the same project, and it hasn't got as much attention as it has with Netflix. And I think uh, appetite for risk, uh, an appetite, an ambitious appetite is something that will always break through that ceiling. And, and I, I think this is just one project of thousands. So I think that's, we're going to see the effects of it pretty soon. And it should start shaking up those sort of structured agencies. And are you seeing an appetite in uh, the African film industry and film producers and the film ecosystem to get engaged with these digital productions themselves? Are you seeing an uptake uh, from the local industry? It really, really is. The key thing is having content that's at that level, that's at, that will reach universal audiences so that there is a, a disconnect as well and a gap with talent and how you get to mm. being able to produce something. So. As a, as a representative of a studio in South Africa, we're very much a part of workshops, mentorship programs, opportunities to get creators to the level, the same level of playing field. Because unless that happens, you're not going to see content come through. There will always be this inequality, and right now it's essential that we break that and bridge those gaps. Mm. Uh, Arjun, let me turn to you. Um, I think uh, what I would like you to do is, in a sense, first. Uh, so Arjun is is. Um, in a series called Made in Heaven, That's right, yeah. where he is uh, playing an LGBTQA persona, and um, uh, he presents it in a unique way, in, 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 in a very normal, everyday kind of a... Yeah, unique uh, because it's normal. It's normal, yeah, yeah. so it's not, <laughs> none of the stereotypes around that. Yeah. Uh, uh, now, uh, my question to you is that, one, uh, being part of this new ecosystem, has it allowed your craft to grow within you? And have you seen yourself change as a performer because of the availability of this new space? Um, okay, I, getting into the creative, like the, the way I perform, it's the same, whether it's for a film or a series or a play. I mean, an actor's an actor and I'm gonna do what I do for whatever the medium is. Uh, yeah, what it has, I think more than an actor, to be honest, it's, uh, it's given writers uh, creators the opportunity to kind of mm -hmm. explore mm -hmm. stories and characters in much greater detail get really get into the uh, you know intricate intricacies of their graph and character and I mean as, as actors we are just lucky enough to get to dive into that material you know but um, yeah yeah I mean the creative process stays the same it's just that um, you stay with it a lot longer while filming a series you know uh, so you're allowed to explore it uh, with greater depth? Yeah, yeah, greater depth, greater length. Uh, yeah, definitely. It's more fun. It's definitely more fun. It, than and, and you have transitioned from the analog world to the digital. In some sense, you've, you've worked in both the stages of... Yeah, I have, actually, yeah. yeah. So uh, does the digital uh, stage pay you as well, the money? Yeah, I mean, that doesn't... Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we charge per day, so... <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, what is the... No, no, I, no, no I, I, I'm not looking yeah. for a career in your craft. <laughs> so, uh, uh, let me ask you another question, because I think this is interesting. Uh, 
one of the challenges is that because in this digital world everyone is so intimately connected to your consumers your audience your uh-huh. uh, 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 the recipients of your messaging through social media through twitter through facebook through yeah. your own uh, pages uh, is there a societal pushback when you try to play a different role like the one that you are playing today so do you see friends family fans uh write to you or express themselves as uh, why are you doing this arjun you should be playing uh, uh, say uh, shahrukh khan's role mm-hmm. uh interestingly uh messages that come to me not one even though i had expected it i thought it would be that would be the case but with this character and this show in particular somehow there hasn't been one single message of uh, you know not a single troll no nothing everything was just it was just pure and simple appreciation i think it really cut across uh gender and generations and you know everyone just connected with the character and the story honestly uh what you were speaking of i have observed more in my own circles to be honest mm. family extended family friends mm. acquaintances mm. you know someone reaching out to me oh i hope your character turns straight in the second season and i was like <laughs> stop being homophobic man you know but uh, yeah they uh, but it's interesting because there has been you know around us uh, in generations above us my father bunch of his friends or you know this uncle they every they all harboring a fair bit of homophobia they have you know and the generation above that even more so but i think uh, with this really i've it's it's been really gratifying to see them my father with his friends sit at the dining table and you know talk about homosexuality as they haven't in uh, you know in front of me ever before so just the fact that these have become dining table conversations i think is a great win firstly you know and and do you feel that in that sense as a performer you have a chance to push the so- social boundaries the societal uh, absolutely. stigmas absolutely absolutely and dogmas. i think and i think we should i think every performer every artist of every medium should be particularly in these times i think where what we are being fed and preached from every angle is kind of an agenda of divisiveness and you know i think we all i think art in all its forms needs to preach inclusivity not just uh, gender equality but like i mean we have to be a voice for minorities you know religious minorities caste minorities gender minorities so i'm glad i have the opportunity to do that through this medium yeah money let me uh, i'm going to pose two questions to you the first is that you know there's an opportunity here for storytelling as never before uh, you know from africa from asia from india and take it to the world right like shrishti was mentioning you're going to 190 geographies at the time you start your uh, release at the time you release your product what can regulators do and this is the positive question how do regulators ensure that this space grows what should be uh, uh, the the policy framework that allows many more such stories to emerge from continents that have never been able to reach the world before so as sitting in uh, part of the, uh, the the ecosystem that creates regulation what is the positive regulation we can think about to grow the sector well uh, one i don't just see myself as a regulator since i belong to the industry since more than two decades as an actor and a producer i think it's celebration time for indian cinema and for narratives which are real uh, which are democratic this is actually a term i used two years ago when i wrote a op-ed in one of the big newspapers in india where i said the ott platforms uh, the way forward is that it is democratization of content so much of diversity this country we are actually india is a land of katha vachaks which means storytellers every nook and corner of this country has so many different stories to tell in so many different languages i also have a problem with the word bollywood hindi film industry has become so top heavy on the narrative of the indian diaspora the diaspora of storytelling from various indian languages tamil telugu marathi gujarati rajasthani so on and so forth so i think ott platforms also have a tremendous opportunity to give this diaspora of narrative this big you know country that we belong to so many more stories can be told 
Number two, the mom and pop shops of the Hindi film industry will now have a challenge because what we were watching as a collective, that means as a filmmaker, I was dependent all my life on a theatrical release, decimates itself immediately because now as a young filmmaker, I have a fantastic platform where I can tell the stories the way I want to tell. I can, I can speak of narratives which have never been spoken before. 190 countries. I mean, when was it that we actually thought a young filmmaker, uh, uh, a woman filmmaker, or a male filmmaker will have that kind of an opportunity. So it's fantastic times. These narratives are also very real, Samir. They are not the rain-drenched hourglass figure of the Hindi film heroine dancing mm. around trees and a man, you know, hitting out at goons, 35 of them, and the woman just being arm candy. These are characters which are real. These are not the baby doll figures who were also objectified for what they were. I mean, look at Made in Heaven and Arjun speaks about it. It's also that the LGBTQ plus community also gets almost mainstreamed with this show. And I think that is the celebration time. So before we get into the realm of looking at regulation, what should be the regulation, we should celebrate the diversity and also the nuances which come with the diversity. One question I always ask my friends that do you understand the difference between looking at a film in a theater and watching the same content on, in your palm? Which means this 35mm screen is a collective, this is private. And I think the journey from the collective to the private is what the journey of any kind of regulatory ecosystem should be. When I sit on CBFC, I have a problem with the word censor also. I keep telling this, I've written about it, I've spoken about it. It's a certification board. It looks at age-related classification. What is for the mature audience? What is for the under-mature audience? But when the content is in my palm, it cannot have the lens of film certification because this palm is private and it is not collective. So positively looking at the ecosystem, let's understand the diversity of the medium. Let us also give it time. Let's have a narrative which is, uh, uh, you know, pan, uh, pan India, where we look at what kind of stories are coming, what kind of content is being created and who's consuming that content. Without understanding the space, we will start shouting regulation, regulation. It will be a disservice to the independence and the democratic nature of this medium that it is. I am not saying that we should not be looking at content if it is uh, creating some kind of havoc somewhere. I don't think it has as yet. Or if it is becoming sensitive in nature, we are also a hypersensitive to democracy. We cannot say that we are not. We are a democratic country, but we have sensitivities towards various kinds of rights that the Constitution of India protects. But I think before we lengthen that debate already, we should look at the diversity, we should celebrate it, and we should actually applaud both the new narrative of Indian cinema, and I'm happy that a Srishti Arya sits here today, because I know so many beautiful young filmmakers who have been dying to make a film for the past one decade, and now that opportunity is just there. It's there, and it's giving them all the possible, you know, uh, the, the, the flowering of that narrative is available to them. So I think you've kind of also touched on the point um, Arjun made, and you've actually also spoken out about it. I think around the movie Kabir Singh. If yes, I, I did. Right. So he says that we have to be sensitive to. Um, no. So I have a, I have an issue there, and I think, despite the fact that the CBFC Central Board of Film Certification gave the film a certificate, I was not part of that film. I did speak about it openly because, as a citizen of this country, as a woman and as a professional, I also have a voice. Misogyny of this kind in the era of the Me Too. And yes, it did earn some 200 odd crores at the box office. So we also have to now start looking at, are we just looking at box office collections as the success parameter of what kind of cinema should be made? Or when a dirty picture and an NH10 and a, a, a Shubh Mangal Savdhan and a Toiletic Prem Katha and a Padman gets made, when was the last time we actually had the courage to make a film around menstruation? Menstruation is not just a taboo in India. It's a taboo topic in various parts mm. of the world. Mm. And we had the courage to do it, and the film was a runaway hit. What does it tell us? We are ready for content, which is For real, real content. For yeah. real. And let us not shove it away and say, oh, this was just a one-off. One decade of this kind of cinema cannot be a one-off. And I think that's why 
this progressive narrative needs to be much more widened in its scope and this diversity needs to be celebrated. Inclusion is a word also which needs to be understood here. Shrishti inclusion, let's move to inclusion. Um, there are, and uh, uh, clearly I'm not an avid film watcher, but I am a student of media. And I'm asking from that perspective, from the nature of the industry, do you think there is a uh, probability or there's a risk that these new mediums will also invest in the tried and tested names, the big brands, you know, Netflix, Karan Johar, uh, or <laughs> Netflix, Shah Rukh Khan. Do you think there's a, there's a risk that you will eventually go back to those, that, you know, to names and figures and, uh, and actors and person, personalities that sell? And that chance for those new actors and actresses and filmmakers will probably be marginal. Uh, you know, the thing is that uh, when we look at content and we look at the opportunity that there is on a streaming service, you know, when you're getting to see the content that you want to see at the time that you want to see it, on the format that you want to see it, uh, what happens is that you want to be able to provide all kinds of uh, material for that. Uh, it's unfortunate that of, uh, you know, of the, of the slate of 24 films that we've announced that we want to focus on only on a Karan Johar or a Shah Rukh Khan for that matter because there are other 22 films that are getting made that don't have big names uh, in them in the traditional way. Uh, they're all big names because they're all big storytellers, you know, and uh, it's only eventually how the stories connect that we're going to really know what that means. But yes, the media tends to pick up just a few names. And uh, when we talk about being inclusive, you can't say excluding mainstream, uh, <laughs> you know, because then that's not very inclusive, is it? And, and what is your industry doing to the gender dynamics of the old industry? <laughs> Uh, you know what's been amazing to see, and I think that's part of the, the opportunity that streaming provides, is that we've been getting a lot of stories from uh, a lot of women, uh, and uh, we've been getting a lot of unusual stories as well. They're stories that people just want to tell. They know that they're not restricted by the format or where they're going to be coming out, and they're essentially going to get the opportunity if they want to say something that's really meaningful to them. So right now on, on our service, we have... Uh, uh, three uh, debutant female directors. We have two debutant male directors. There are male uh, producers who've come with uh, female directors, female producers who've come with male directors. And all that they're interested in is telling their stories, putting it out there. And like, like Vani was saying, you know, we're going to put out a young filmmaker's work to 190 countries, which is not going to be specified by where you're watching it. It's just going to be how good your content is, how much it resonates with the viewer. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a wonderful time. And we as Netflix really want to push the narrative and put it out there that it's just about storytelling. We are katha vachaks, to quote. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's something that now we have an opportunity for the whole world to see. So, again, you know, when you, uh, as, a, as someone who's curating content uh, and is seeking to build a film <laughs> library um, out of India, uh, are you also thinking global when you source these? Or are you still limited by the geography of the location you're working in? So, do you pick up films to, uh, in India for a global audience, your, your entire online community? Or is it still, for those one point, you know, the, uh, yesterday the minister was mentioning uh, one billion Indians are going to be online in the next few years? Uh, a good story, I don't think, is restricted by where it comes out of. And we've seen that with Sacred Games. Uh, we've seen it with uh, La Casa de Papel, which is a Spanish show that's come out, or with Mighty Little Beam for us as well. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, this is anecdotal, but like uh, Navas was shooting for... Uh, Rome, Rome, May, which is a movie that's just going to be premiering at a festival coming up next week. Mm -hmm. uh, he was shooting in Italy with an Italian actress where there were people, Italians looking at him and saying, Gai tonde. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't think it's, a in, the, the intent is always to tell a, a, a true story, something with a passionate creator behind, and that finds an audience, and uh, this is an opportunity on streaming where it's not restricted by access. Uh, you know, uh, Arjun mentioned an important point about uh, responsibility. Uh, and, you know, we had, and I'm going to repeat it again, we had Anurag Kashyap here a couple of years ago, and he says that his responsibility is to the craft. I asked him a question, that if you glorify violence to such an extent in a world where radicalization is now rampant, and, you know, his movies normally, normally the hero is the bad guy in, in Anurag Kashyap, you know, the, the largest attention and the camera angles and the, uh, the narratives centralize the, the bad guy in his movies. Uh, the question is that when you see hate, when we see radicalization, when we see certain kinds of uh, tendencies being amplified in the world, as producers, as investors, as creators, as, and I'm going to ask all of you to respond to this question, uh, do you think we have to be careful because we have the ability to influence minds? 
so do you think we should be ma- more careful before glorifying violence or like the kabir saying glorifying misogyny or uh, uh, you know uh, uh, ostracizing people based on their sexual preferences or gender or religious and caste identity I would say that uh, there's one thing to be said which a filmmaker said to me a long time ago uh, which was that every character is the hero in his own story mm-hmm. right so when you're it uh, I think part of the democratization of this is that you don't take a side in terms of whose story you're telling as long as it's true and authentic we always aim to be within the law uh, we are sensitive about the story that you want to tell and what is the motivation it's like uh, you know it just because uh, you know, there's a difference between a, a woman getting drenched in the rain and running around for no reason versus somebody who got caught without a taxi and that could be like a major part of the story so it all depends on where you're coming from so the context is important. the context is always the most important thing when i said you want to come in on this on the responsible cinema or the responsible storytelling I personally definitely feel responsible. Um I think that's why I play in the, the family friendly space. Um just because I really think content um should be enjoyed by the family. And so the so being in animation has been something I've chosen because I really feel like positive messaging and um letting letting storytellers have their voice but because so for me I I I am affected by what I see and so it's as on a personal level I will choose um films and tv series that i think i can handle and that i can um but i am open to people having a voice and having a say and there's an there's a space for every for every kind of story um but i believe that it should be it should be filtered it should go through um certification um and that's very important um for every country but personally i'm i'm in the family friendly space for a reason <laughs> no i'm sorry, sorry to chime in on this but i think as a service what we try to ensure is that we always give an indication of what it is that you're going to be watching the disclosure part we are always disclosing that and it's never going to come to you as a surprise so it's your choice uh, about what it is that you want to watch and uh, as, you know we love all kinds of stories and we're not going to be like not including things that are a little harder to watch but we just going to make sure that our subscribers at all times are aware of what it is that they're watching what is your take on responsible storytelling well i think when i certify a film i look at the context of the narrative of the story for example if the film is about the hinterland and the criminology of a certain region the person is not going to speak like the padre of a church and i think that is where the distinctions have to be made and i think there's a very important word called intention Mm. or intent mm. and i think through the past few years me being the junior's most veteran of that board i've constantly spoken also in public space that you will know the intention in the first 20 seconds of a film or a series if the intention is to create hate and to create certain kind of provocation you will immediately know it now what is the difference between seeing provocation on a very large screen and seeing provocation in the palm of your hand there is a certain independence in a sense of choice that you have when it is in the palm of your hand which means that you can either shut it off or if you are on tv you'll change the channel but when you see it as a collective and that is where i always make this very clear to people we certify films looking at the intention and the context of the narrative i think the similar story will play out whatever the medium is if your intention is to uh, be misogynistic as it was in kabir singh i mean it was a shame that that film made so much money probably one of the worst and here it was not the anti hero so many people wrote to me oh what about mogambo khushua which was a very big film called mr india in the 90s remember that was the anti hero here the protagonist was the worst kind of misogynist mm. so which means that you will know the intention and that context will become very very clear to you and that should become the reason or should become the rationale to look at how that person or how that particular piece of uh, content should be uh, you know whether it should be regulated or classified but i think let us also give it to the creators they are not morons there are people who also have and i am coming to something which very seldom gets discussed commercial interests in the market hmm. you want to sell your wares there is a big market for it and you are here in this space also for business you think it will be a uh, uh, progressive for them or it will help them economically if they will create it and then get away with it at the end of the day in a democratic country like india if you will propel hate there will be a backlash to it and i think that awareness lies 
with the person who's creating that content. Let us not forget, if at 18 we are giving the right to vote to every citizen in the country, similarly age-rated classification, adult viewing is for a mature audience, let us not scream at their intelligence. They have a certain way of looking at things and we should allow them to see it as independently as it can be. So I'm going to get you all into this conversation. Uh, and uh, you can uh, walk to the mics and <coughs> pose questions. But I, let me ask Arjun, uh, since you are the, uh, the star here, <laughs> you know, with, let me ask you, is it different? Like, you know, uh, uh, when Rajesh Khanna was a star or Shah Rukh or Amita, you know, the, the cinema halls were mobbed and there were uh, queues of kilometers and, you know, uh, men and women would do absurd things to, uh, to watch the movies. It's changed, right? When you are in a private screen, uh, the whole concept of this uh, superstar itself is undergoing change. How, how in your transition from the old to the new, have you seen this change? What does it mean being a star today? Uh, my personal experience, well, I think that that kind of started changing anyway with, uh, with the internet and social media before any of this, you know, because I think in the 80s or 90s, our stars were quite inaccessible. The only... All you know, you just read about them, what you read about them in the magazine or watched on Lehre on TV or something. Um, I think now with social media, just everyone's accessible. Mm. You can speak to whoever you want, you can say whatever you want to anyone you want. I think so that kind of changed it anyway. I personally, I don't think I'm a star. Uh, you know, I have been working for 10 to 12 years as an actor and I've had a very slow and steady trajectory. Um, even now, even with Made in Heaven, it's not like it was some overnight crazy stardom that came to me. It was a lot of appreciation from a very different kind of audience. Mm. You know, they were, mm. it was, people wanted to come up to me and actually talk to me and uh, kind of uh, share stories of how this has helped them come out to their family or help them come out at work or about how now they'll be more sensitive and supportive towards their own children if they turn out to be gay. And... Um, so things like that, I have not experienced this, what you... So it's a very different kind of interaction today. Yeah, uh, but, absolutely, absolutely. But, so, uh, Vanessa, you wanted to come in. I, I just love that um, all this content starts c conversation. And I think we were chatting earlier on a panel just about how artificial intelligence may um, overtake our, our human creativity, and I really don't think it will. If we are storytellers, the, the key is to connect with your audience and to, and to be able to walk away having understood something, have felt something, be moved by something. How beautiful, how wonderful. And, and the amount of different contents and stories being told today will only do that, just so that, we can, that we're closer connected as, as humankind. And how amazing to do that, and just to regulate that or to not allow that or filter that would be sad. Excellent. So, um, do you want to come in, Amita? Please. You can, guys, you can walk to the mic and, and pose your questions. Uh, hi, my name is Utkarsh. My quick question is that, uh, you know, a lot has changed about the audience, the way they're consuming content. But what hasn't changed? If you look back from the 90s to right now, there is still uh, an audience that is not receptive to the message, that is, you know, that's waiting to take offense to something. Uh, do, you, do you struggle to grapple with that? Uh, and also on a more generic note, uh, are there some common strands about the Indian consumer or the Indian viewer that has remained the same? Shishti, do you want to take that? Because you've, yeah. been, you've been building a, you know, a business around that. <laughs> well, happy to, happy to. Uh, what hasn't changed is that uh, the power of a great story will never change. If you can make somebody feel something, then you're always going to be coming out on tops for that. Uh, I think the opportunity for everybody's voice to be heard, like Arjun was saying, has come out a lot because of social media. So you do hear more chatter than you would have possibly heard earlier. And uh, you're able to see almost every single person's reaction to the material. And uh, if you're pleasing everybody, then you're doing something wrong. Yeah. Because the whole point of art is to create conversation and to you know, stimulate you into feeling something. Does that answer your question? Vani, you want to come in? You know, uh, I'll just give you a very simple example of how Hindi is spoken in India. A person sitting in Orissa will speak the, the same language that you and I speak in Delhi, sitting here, differently than a person who, whose mother tongue may be Bengali and somebody who is probably uh, speaking in Marathi. So the point is that there is no one size fits all to storytelling. And that's the same for somebody who's creating the content. It's, it's also similarly uh, you know, true for somebody who's consuming it. 
you sitting in a far away town you know uh, uh, 400 kilometers away from a big metropolis may probably look at that story in a different context that's why these contexts will change according to the diversity that we are we should celebrate the fact that the same film which may be working in the seven eight center cities of the country may be a complete flop in the sea center towns of india and I think this diversity should be celebrated and should not be criticized that, you know, I am understanding this, why is the other person not? Probably the lens should be, if the other person is not understanding it similarly, I should be able to sense that sense of belief that he or she has. Somebody but also asked, uh, uh, oh sorry, you want to come in? Uh, just a quick question. Do you think for that uh, Singh movie that you just mentioned, do you think the audience 20 years back or 30 years back would have also taken, uh, would have liked it as much as they did right now? You know, probably cinema was most progressive couple of days ago. It has had its emotional parabola of the up and the down. But what shocks me that in 2019, when it's not just about women rights, it's about also gender equity and equality that we discuss every day. And the, in the era of the Me Too, a misogynistic portrayal of a protagonist like this can be celebrated. But then equivocally, you also saw that there were so many people who came, came out, out and spoke men and women who spoke against it. No, but he also asked an interesting question. And I think that's something I want to post to all of you. Vanessa, let me start with you. <laughs> he also asked you that people take offense. Right, certain things work in certain geographies because the same content is available everywhere. Uh, certain communities, cultures take offense to certain kind of content. And um, today I think it's, um, uh, we are in the age of everyone being offended quite easily. So in this age where everyone tends to get offended quite easily, as a filmmaker, as an artist, um, how do you respond to that? How do you respond to this fact that some people will get angry with what you do? E even let's take the story of the four girls who are going to school. Uh, did, you know, did you see uh, a, a certain kind of pushback at certain times? Um, no, I haven't seen any pushback. Um, and I think how, how you deal with offense is that if it's, if it's an immature um, <laughs> conversation, that people will actually be able to talk about that offense and, and try to listen to someone else's point of view. So personally, I'm not, I'm not I won't, back away from someone who has an opinion that's different to mine related to a film or a series, I'd want to know why. And I hope that they would do the same. So um, I think it's a tricky time because um, social media and you're able to say absolutely anything you want once you've seen content. And I think there, there is a tendency that certain views will create some sort of hype. But I think um, it's, it's a very complex um, time that we're living in. But I, I really just hope that people will look to to finding a balance in the conversation and that respect would precede everything in that conversation and uh, aside from even why they're offended and that they would respect someone else's opinion and why that was made and, and vice versa. So you think that this is the rather, uh, we should look at this as an opportunity to engage on, uh, on, the, on the different people. Um, uh, Arjun, for you? Um, you know, before, before anything, I want to uh, speak a little bit about this, that I myself am someone who believes very much that right now is a time in the world, in history, where there's no excuse to really make empty cinema, you know. The content we create should really stir something, start some conversation, you know, uh, make people feel something. Uh, I want to talk about the same film she's been speaking of, Kabir Singh, because when it released, I, and I read everything that was uh, being said about it, and I myself was kind of uh, automatically biased against it. Uh, because I'm all for, you know, uh, not for misogyny at all and all about sh shattering patriarchy and stuff. But uh, I very recently, just a couple of days ago on a flight, I happened to watch the film. And uh, I could not help but think that, you know what, the actor here has done a very good job of portraying the character he's supposed to portray. And uh, the film at the end of it, it is, as we were also speaking backstage, at the end of it, the film is a narrative. It is a narrative that exists. It is, uh, you know, it's the job of cinema to really reflect society as it exists and to start a conversation. And I think that this film has done. I don't think it is, um, I don't think it is our place to be telling a filmmaker that no, this, you should not be, you cannot be showing this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, these are just some thoughts because I myself was very conflicted about why why am I not 
disliking this film as much as I thought I would, you know. And yeah, so it's just something that left me with a question itself that with, it left me with this question actually, that where do you, you know, what is art here, what is life and, you know, and art is not supposed to, uh, it's supposed to make you uncomfortable, honestly. It's not supposed to be, uh, just show you what you want to watch. Mm. You know what I mean? You mm. should be able, it should show you things that make you uncomfortable, yeah. So that's what I think about that. So uh, another thing that uh, Vani mentioned, which I want to actually uh, now pose to Shrishti and perhaps even to uh, uh, when, uh, you know, Vanessa, who's again in a quite a complex uh, continent in terms of the richness of diversity. Uh, what about this linguistic hegemony? I think you spoke about it. She spoke about the language diaspora. And uh, are we still investing in the same kind of language films? And I think that's something that I often wonder that you will still invest in a Hindi language film no matter which the platform because you see that there is a certain earning potential there. How is that changing in a platform or in a VOD and ecosystem? Well, Samir, we all have to start somewhere, hmm. right? So you can't just start all over the place meaningless just because you're trying to cover everything. So I think the way that we work at Netflix is that we did start with English. Hmm. And uh, today we have, uh, you know, uh, we are working out of Latin America, we are working out of India, we are working out of uh, Korea, we are working out of Japan. So everything kind of grows at, at, at its own pace. Mm -hmm. It's uh, something that we will get to. Uh, however, the license side, we are trying to ensure that we get as much content as we possibly can mm -hmm. uh, in various languages and hopefully we will progress into uh, the regional languages. Uh, and you, you, know, you do uh, dub them? In, in we dub, uh, yes we do. We dub in uh, various languages, not all languages for everything. But uh, between, uh, I mean, you know, we, we can go up to, like we did on Sacred Games, dub in 26 languages. Not all it? Indian, globally. Globally. Yeah. So you, you are, you, much of your content will very soon be available in many of these languages. Yes, that's the intention. Uh, and uh, Vani, how do we make our storytelling uh, more, uh, you know, rich in terms of the languages we narrate them in? I think I, again, I'm asking you to, you keep escaping from your role no. as a regulator. <laughs> I'm saying what is the role of the government to ensure that, uh, you know, stories other than in Hindi are being told in India. Okay, and you now, keep saying I'm an entertainer. Now, Even now, I'm an entertainer. <laughs> now take a wild guess how many films do we certify in a year? And this is open to all my friends. How many films do we the certify? The Nat Geo wild figure that you can think of. Anybody? I said Nat Geo wild. Get wild. Come on, get wild. Huh? Well, who's this? Who did who? Who heard me at the World Economic Forum last week? <laughs> Anjan Mitra. Anjan Mitra. It's actually 22 to 24 thousand films across languages, across formats in the country, and it keeps growing and growing every year. Which should tell you that the diversity of languages in the country definitely reflects in the certification of cinema in the country. One, and we are not just the biggest one of the largest film producing nations of the world. We are one of the largest film producing nations of the world in many, many languages. So which also is a daunting task to certify this much. It's not a joke. I mean, we are just that much of what is called a certification board. We are ably, uh, you know, uh, co-opted by many, many people who are panel members, various zonal offices and so on. But I think to make the diversity rich, First, let's drop this word Bollywood. It's a poor cousin of Hollywood, Collywood, Tollywood, sounds like Follywood. <laughs> we are the Indian film industry with so many languages to cover. It's time to celebrate that diversity of language. Number two, for example, in the past couple of years, the good part is whether it's the Cannes Film Festival or Berlin, Toronto, Busan, it's non-Indian language, non-Hindi language films which have started to become big, you know, draw, big, big, uh, you know, uh, uh, they have big eyeballs there. The Oscar-nominated entries from India in the past couple of years have been Marathi, have been Tamil, have been Malayalam. So I think the diversity can only enrich as more and more filmmakers, new filmmakers with great rich narratives get attention globally, we should help them. And I think the government is doing at least that much by giving a platform to the new filmmakers to go abroad and showcase their uh, films. And I think that itself is a very big change. Mm. It's a very big change in terms of the linguistic diversity of the country. Uh, uh, yeah, just to add to that, actually, I think even our biggest uh, Bollywood producers are seeing it now because everyone from a dharma to XL 
to uh, you know they've all been presenting Tamil Malayalam films now for a bit, for a while. Anurag just today announced he's pre he's presenting his first Assamese film. So you know it's definitely uh, growing. Uh, uh, Vanessa, Africa again. I think because it's such a big uh, continent with so many different countries and languages, there have been certain industries that have dominated uh, the entertainment space there. Is that changing, or do you still believe that they still control the narrative in, in the continent? Um, so that South Africa controls. It's South Africa, Nigeria, and I think Kenya to some extent. Mm. Um, I think it's really growing. It's certainly not growing as big as India, so congratulations on that. That requires a lot of support from many, many bodies just to get that right. I think, um, you know, they, they, the continent is huge, uh, 54 countries. Um, and so many levels of control and, and policy. Um, what I love about Africa uh, is the entrepreneurship and the way that artists will find their work to their audience. So if it's um, restricted by money and they, <clears throat> excuse me, they can't create animation, they will do a digital comic. They will take that online. They will find an audience to tell their story. And they're not shy to figure out how that works and do it themselves. Get their hands dirty. Um, create, produce, fund, self-fund is, is, is huge on the continent and I love that about, um, and about, the, about the creators on the continent. I think it would be amazing if we had as much support as, as, as clearly India has from policy and, fr and from government. But um, I, I know that it's growing and it's growing because the artists are willing and, and are not gonna be held back. And if they were supported, goodness, who knows what the growth would be like then. So, um, yes, South Africa is definitely forefront of the animation space and the filmmaking space. We service a lot of international work. But what is so exciting is that um, as a studio and as many other creators I know, we're wanting to create our own content. We're, we're tired of being the service providers to the world because the RAND is so weak. We're wanting to, and I'm sure India is the same in the animation industry, it services a massive amount Correct. of other people's stories. It's really by time that we get support to tell our own stories and to give the writers and, and creators of those stories opportunity to tell them and to be supported. Um, and, then I, and then I know it'll grow in an amazing way. So I think South Africa and uh, Africa and India are assembly in that way where um, it's by time we got to tell our stories more and authentic stories. Uh, so, you know, uh, I want to perhaps, you know, move this panel from that nice space that we have reached. We are a global film industry or an Indian film industry telling stories for the world and come back to the locality where we still have something called, and no matter how good or bad it is, it's something called the government. Uh, and I want to actually, no, I, I, and, and I'm serious about it, I, and it's not about your space, it's not about the entertainment space or, or my space, the academic space or some other spaces. I think the general tendency over the last five to seven years, perhaps uh, post the financial crisis when the states had to step in to intervene and fix things up, the states have returned to manage much, many aspects of our lives today. The state today, and I'm, I'm talking about Europe, I'm, I'm talking about the US, I'm talking about Asia, India, uh, countries in Africa. The states are more, um, uh, in a sense, present in most sectors today than they were, say, uh, in the heydays of globalization in the last decade. Uh, what are the challenges of a more uh, present state in the creative sector? Uh, and I'm not talking about regulation alone. I'm also talking about uh, states uh, promoting certain kind of, you know, you, you have certain countries invest in certain channels to promote uh, soft power. Uh, you have states getting into the business of, of storytelling and creating narratives. The state is now a producer by itself. Uh, and of course, this is more in the new space and less in the creative space, but I know many states investing in documentaries, investing in certain kind of films to create imagery around uh, uh, their own brand. Now, what does this do to the creative space, Vani? You see, uh, well, if you look at the fantastic whatever was called art house cinema of the 70s and 80s and the 90s. There was a National Film Development Corporation which also co-produced Gandhi of Richard Attenborough which got the Oscars that year and it still remains uh, like a testimony of history. So I don't think it's all very wrong for the government or what you call the state to invest in culture, entertainment and the arts because at the end of the day in a democracy which has so many billion people you know being a part of it Creating films, creating content should very much be a part of the diaspora, which also gets showcased outside the country. 
Now, as far as the soft power bit, whether we like it or not, it is the courtesy of the Indian film industry. It is a soft power for India. When people go outside, you know, India, it's cricket, which is always discussed. It's, it's cinema, which is always discussed. Our film stars, our directors are celebrated for their great work. Now, at the end of the day, that sense of identity, which gets created for where they belong to, it shouldn't be wished away. It should be celebrated. The government being a collaborator, so I'm going to use a progressive word called collaborator. This is a shared collaboration when we say private-public partnership. Even for creation of content in cinema, there should be a PPP model. The government should help young independent filmmakers who do not have the 100 crore club to ride on, who do not have access to studios, want to make good films about various parts of the country, various tales of India, they should be helped by the government. Mm. And here, to have that kind of conspiracy theory that the state is going to uh, steer its own agenda by doing so will be a misnomer. It will actually not help the narrative. Rather, we are all working towards a macro umbrella uh, you know, organization which should emerge in the next few years, which helps children's cinema, looks at women filmmakers. I want to very proudly tell you, and I have shared this with Vanessa, last year at the Berlinal and the Berlin Film Festival, I met the f one of the first countries to make a women film commission was South Africa. And when editors, cinematographers, and technicians were not supposed to be women, they already had it because the government steered a policy where they had a film commission which helped the women filmmakers and women editors, cinematographers, and technicians. So similarly, it's the role of the government to help the industry to blossom and progress. Remember when Sushma Swaraj was the INB minister during Atal Bihari Vajpayee's time, the industry status that the film industry got helped in channelizing legal funding for the industry today. So today, the progressiveness the status, and the yes. development that you see is all somewhere abetted by governments, so many governments. So I think we should not give this kind of a, you know, skepticism that the government should not be a part of. It should very much be a part of. It should be a collaborator, a progressive collaborator. And it should help the narrative of films, and especially filmmakers who want to showcase India, want to show their stories to the world and do not have the prowess, economic prowess to do so. Government should definitely be a collaborator and should help them. And it is, I think, trying to do so right now. Shishti, your take on the state being, you know, many other states, and I'm not necessarily referring to India, but I can, we can certainly talk about some of our eastern neighbors who are putting in large sums of money to broadcast, create, curate content that is available to uh, different geographies to recast their image. Uh, you know, so how do you, in a sense, as an individual entrepreneur, uh, see that opportunity or uh, development? Uh, I think that as an individual, uh, it depends on what your belief systems are and what you want to collaborate with, right? So eventually, it's the choice of the artist and the story that they want to tell, how they want to get it out. And, and uh, the fact that, uh, like Bani, Bani was saying, that there is also a public service aspect to government, where you nudge the industry in certain direction, you encourage certain kind of performers and creators. Do you think, is that the role of the state? I think every opportunity for an artist to blossom should be provided to them. Hmm. Arjun, you've been thinking about this. Uh, no, I was just thinking that, uh, yeah, exactly that, that uh, they should be involved. State government should be involved in supporting uh, and helping the industry blossom. Propaganda is a different thing, you know, where, they, uh, where, 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 they, where the state is involved in making films uh, that only further their own agenda is a completely different thing, I think. That's what I was thinking, yeah. And Vanessa, your take on this? Um, I'm, I'm really just very excited about how private sector plays into all of this. Um, I have strong opinions about how the state, especially South Africa, um, but what excites me is, is the series that I'm currently producing um, with the team at Netflix is that they had said to me in very early conversations that yes, we understand Netflix is not streaming in every African con uh, country. It's in South Africa, Kenya, and I think um, Nigeria at this stage. 
But what we would love to do is once it's streaming on the platform, we'd like to release it to Africa for free, to broadcast, to linear broadcasters, so that this content can be consumed by the audience that, it should, that should be consuming it. And how wonderful that private sector can actually do that and enable that this content travels. So huge kudos to the Netflix team for being such visionaries in this space and, and not just relying on state to come in to kind of rescue an industry which needs help and, and that audiences get to enjoy diverse content, but to actually where they can come in and say, we know this is not, doesn't help us and we don't have Netflix across Africa, but because that is an is a growing market, what we'll do is provide um, this content to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the continent, which is super exciting. Mari, let me close with the last question to you. We have seven, 13 seconds, so you can, you can give a short answer. Do you think it's time in this digital age to disband the CBFC, uh, disband regulation, and allow personal choices, preferences, and the private screen to decide the future of storytelling in cinema? I think every country in the world, including France and America and the United Kingdom and so many other countries have certification boards. So disbanding something which is age-related classification and certification for theatrical releases cannot be disbanded, should not be, because it's about, you know, what kind of content should be consumed. But yes, with the advent of the digital space and with its democratization, giving that kind of independence, the choice today lies with the viewer. Mm. as much as it does with the content creator. So that says yes. <laughs> okay, so we will take that for a yes. It's time to rethink regulation completely. Government has a role to incubate the industry to promote certain kind of new actors to have access. Uh, the private sector sees this as a new age where it's stories that were never told before um, can actually be now uh, taken to the world. Um, continents can, which were, uh, which were outside the, the cultural roots of, uh, framed by the Hollywood age, uh, can now become more mainstream. And of course, um, responsible storytelling uh, is something that this immediate age of ours requires. I think we are going through a period of flux, change, challenges, and of course, an opportunity to respond to those. So please join me in applauding the panelists for their wonderful interventions. And 